Hello everyone and welcome to another Directions Mag Geospatial webinar, today co-sponsored by the Geotech Center and Directions Magazine. I'm Barbara Duke, Managing Editor here at Directions Mag with our Assistant Webinar Producer, Lynette Qualia. If you have any questions about your connection, just drop us a note in the chat. We'll do our best to help you. For those of you who may not know Directions Magazine, we've been a respected source of geospatial information and news for over 20 years. We encourage you to stop by directionsmag.com to read our feature articles, daily news, and of course, attend more geospatial webinars. Uh, Dr. Rick, Rich Schultz is here to tell us more about the Geotech Center. Rich, welcome. Thank you, Barbary. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dr. Rich Schultz, and I'm the Associate Director and Co-PI of the National Science Foundation-funded National Geospatial Technology Center of Excellence, which we just affectionately refer to as the Geotech Center. We are an advanced technology education five-year grant initiative. Its headquarters are located at Jefferson Community and Technical College in Louisville, Kentucky. Our director is Vince Dinoto, and we are funded by the National Science Foundation through the year 2022 as a National Center of Excellence. At the Geotech Center, our primary areas of focus are in developing curriculum for geospatial and also unmanned aerial systems programs, specifically for two-year institutions across the U.S. We have also created a personal competency tool to assess geospatial skill sets for anyone to use freely. We have more than 10 model geospatial courses for all to infuse into their coursework. We also have a national map that depicts all geospatial programs across the U.S., which is both two-year and four-year institutions. We have annual awards for the geospatial community. We have a collection of archived webinars from our past events, specifically those here with Directions Magazine. We have pertinent geospatial articles, resources. We mentor and have opportunities for mentoring provided for institutions. We have a syllabi repository and also our centerpiece, Geospatial Technology Competency Model, or GTCM. Uh, additionally, we hold a GeoEd conference every year in June uh, to disseminate the information and for folks to network. And most recently, we have been piloting a national certification program cohort that's entitled, entitled GSTEDC, which stands for Geospatial Technologies Education Certification. And that provides educators with a certification in the teaching and learning of geospatial technologies. So we'll constantly be adding to our products and our services and our collection over the coming weeks and months. So check us out on geotechcenter.org, as you can see on your screen. And I will send it back to Barbary. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Lots of great resources over there at the Geotech Center. So folks, we are taking your questions today. We're going to address those at the end of the session. So type those in at any time. We'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Also, if you see something that you like on the screen, uh, click that little camera button and it will save a photo to your desktop. We are um, going to share everything with you following the webinar so keep an eye on your inbox and we also have certificates available for you so all that will be coming to you following the webinar in the next day or so today we are excited to learn more about open education resources with adam dastra at salt lake community college he was recently honored for his work and we are thrilled to have him with us today so, Adam, um, I know that you have a lot to share with us in terms of resources and how these things work. So uh, it's over to you, please. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Dastra. Uh, I'm a full, full professor in the geosciences department at Salt Lake Community College. Um, that includes uh, programs in atmospheric science, geology, geography, surveying, GIS, drones, remote sensing, anything basically geo. Um, I'm over that department. And I'm also a senior researcher for the National Geotech Center for, Ex for Excellence that uh, Rich was talking about earlier. 
And so here's what I'm kind of hoping to cover today. Um, first thing I'd like to do is kind of look at Salt Lake Community College's OER initiative. My thoughts were is, you know, there were over 200 people that registered. There's nearly 100 people attending right now. Um, that's probably, there's probably a huge range of people who are interested in open educational resources, some who have never done it before, who wonder just how to get started. Others may be more interested in how to actually get more robust in it. Others may be interested a little bit with uh, how our institution actually sustains our OER initiative. So that's kind of what I'm gonna hopefully try to cover is first just look at my college's initiative um, then kind of move over to just what is an open educational resource. Hopefully that's not too simple for most people. And then move over to what uh, what I've been doing, which is this open geography education since 2014. So kind of look at how I started it, what's my philosophy behind it, how I create my OER, and how it has evolved. And then kind of just open it up for discussion for the last maybe 15, 20 minutes, um, and just see what questions you might have. So. Um, so to get us started, first quick question, why should colleges or universities consider using or creating open educational resources or what's called OER? Um, so I thought maybe I'd first just kind of look at Salt Lake Community College at first, uh, some of the data I was able to pull off of our website to kind of give you a, um, the back end of us and why OER is so important to us as, a, as an initiative and as a philosophy and even as a culture at our institution. So first off, Salt Lake Community College is, is Utah's largest, sometimes second largest uh, college in the state of Utah. We have over 60,000 students that attend our institutions who are quite large. Uh, we have nine campuses, all within one county, and then we have online courses. Um, this first graph here is kind of just showing you just the age of our students. So um, being an urban community college, you know, we have most of our students, they don't, well, none of our students live on campus. They are commuting. And the vast majority of them, 57%, are non traditional. So our students start, in that 57% of our students are attending at the age of 21 to 29, um, not directly out of high school. Um, there's a few reasons for why there's that break there at the beginning. Some of it has to do with the LDS Church here and their missionary program. Um, but for the most part, most of our students are uh, working uh, part-time or three-fourths time or full-time, have kids, are uh, commuting, and so they're just considered non-traditional students. If we look at the demographics of our, of our college, at least looking at um, students of color, the vast majority of our students are Hispanic slash Latino. Um, and then you can see how it breaks down with the Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander, Black community, Asian. And uh, I'm very interested to see what the 2020 census shows for us, because from the 2000, the 2010 census, the Hispanic population grew in the state by 70%, so 70% from 2020 So I'm interested to see what 2010 to 2020 is gonna do. And I've been trying to work with the college already um, and our Utah State Board of Education to kind of start mapping out um, these demographic changes in our K-12 system and then how that might impact community colleges and our four-year schools. Um, one of the goals at Salt Lake Community College is that our student population uh, will try to mirror the, the, the county population. So you can see our Salt Lake County has a Hispanic population of roughly 20%. Um, at the school, our enrollments um, are 15%, that's actually gone up, and I was kind of surprised my college's website doesn't have anything past 2014. Here we are, 2020, so uh, my cabinet better expect a, uh, an email from me after this webinar. Um, so anyway, but our Hispanic population continues to grow um, in the valley and also in our classrooms. Now, if we look at the demographic change again from 2010 to 2014, what you can see here is that the Hispanic population every year continues to grow. Well, not continues to grow, but it's definitely in the positive. Um, 2014 was a weird year in general. Um, if we move on to 2015 to 2020, it's basically the same trend line, that we have more and more Hispanics uh, attending our college, and we're having more white or Caucasian students not attending Salt Lake Community College. 
it's not that they're not going to school, they're just um, going to the other four year schools instead. So like the University of Utah, which is now a Pac-12, or maybe Utah State or BYU, or uh, some of the other four year schools we have. But what that's getting at is that our student population is definitely getting more diverse. Um, and so we're trying to um, consider that, uh, teach to that, also looking at hiring practices at our college also so that um, so that our students, as, the, as our classrooms get more diverse, so does our faculty and staff and administrators at the institution as well. Um, this one here, what, what's the main reason why students go to Salt Lake Community College based off a survey that the college did a little bit ago is affordability. Um, that's why they're gonna come to us instead of maybe the University of Utah or a private school like BYU. These uh, numbers here are probably pretty consistent across the nation. Most students who go to a community college are going there for cost um, and affordability, maybe flexibility as well. Um, and it's not that higher quality programs isn't an issue. It's just definitely the number one reason why our students are coming to us is because of those costs. So that becomes a conversation when we move into the OER. Now, uh, why are they, when they do come here, what do they want? Um, most of them are coming to SLIC to uh, transfer. They want their two-year degree or their associate's degree and um, get a degree and transfer to, to go get a four-year degree. Um, we do have a dual mission in our college. So we also have not just transfer, but we have workforce training, CTE. And my GIS program is kind of, kind of hovers between transfer and workforce. And right now our drone program is more on the workforce side of our training. So, but this is kind of showing you what, why the students actually come to Salt Lake Community College. And then my last data slide for my school is just looking at this. So almost half of our students, so 46% roughly of the 60,000 students that come to my college are taking two to three classes a semester. So anywhere from maybe four to nine, uh, four to nine credit hours roughly. Um, and so, and then we have, you know, 25% who are going full time. And though we have a lot of, uh, um, we've kind of consolidated a lot of our grants at our college and have created something called SLCC Promise, which is trying to nudge students to not take nine, but if you take one more class and go to full time, we will find ways to make, almost make your tuition non-existent. Um, and yet, even with those initiatives, our students are still only taking two to three classes, right? Uh, rather than going full time. And the reason why for that goes back to these are students who are, it's an urban school, they're working full time, um, they got families to raise, they, they're not living on campus. And so it takes a student at most community colleges, because this is also very typical at any community college, but um, it takes our students roughly six years to get a two year degree if they're only taking uh, six to 11 credit hours a semester. So, you know, there's a there's a retention concern with that of uh, sometimes in that six years to get just to get that tier degree, their life gets in the way. And uh, so we're trying to find ways to help help them through all that. So if we go back to um, my original question. Why should community well, why should colleges and universities consider using or creating OER? Um, there's a lot of reasons why if you go to conferences like the Open Education Conference or the Open Education Consortium, which is the global one, you know, there's a lot of reasons why people want to do OER. Um, and I kind of just broke it down to two, uh, two main reasons, at least at our institution. Um, one of them has to do with social justice or equity. And uh, with the social justice slash equity, it right comes down to, the, again, the cost. So if the majority of our students are going to uh, our school for affordability, but tuition keeps rising, um, state funding keeps decreasing, um, textbook uh, prices keep going up, uh, you know, this becomes a very problematic uh, concern for students. And many studies have found that students will uh, end up taking almost a tuition's worth of, or have to buy almost a tuition's worth of textbooks per year um, on top of their tuition. So they're paying almost over, you know, over $1,200, $1,500 a year 
just on textbooks, and that's not counting everything else with student fees and parking and just the, the tuition. Um, another reason why it's important to do OER is because of equitability or how it dem uh, democrat, uh, democratizes education, meaning that it, it helps level the playing field. Um, some of the data I was looking from our students is a, a minimum of a third of our students uh, do not buy a textbook. Um, and they find other ways to go around that. They go to the library, they share it with friends. Um, there's a variety of reasons, or they're waiting for their financial aid to show up, which may not be till the third or fourth week. Um, and if you have students who don't have a textbook for the first three weeks or four weeks, there's a higher probability that they will not do well in your class. And if you do OER, that gives students access to the material on the first day. And it didn't cost them anything to have that happen. It also provides faculty an opportunity for faculty to create um, inclusive content that allows students to see themselves in the textbook. So in my textbooks, one thing that's been very, um, uh, one thing I've been really trying to focus on is giving other voices to what I'm trying to provide. Um, I get who I am, um, you know, I'm white, straight, male, middle class. I understand all my privilege, and, I, and I'm aware that that could be problematically added to my OER content. And what I want my students to be able to see is themselves in the content, themselves in the textbook. So um, as you'll see in my textbook, uh, when I try to use more multimodal sources, I want people of color, I want LGBTQ plus uh, scientists um, in my book, representing the discipline. Um, but so my students see that the, that the discipline of geography is not just diverse in the knowledge, but diverse in the people who created that knowledge. Um, and then there's the faculty side that's, you know, also I think highly important. One thing I've said to many people at my institution and if I present at conferences is uh, creating OER content to me has been the greatest form of academic freedom that I've ever had to, or I've ever had. Um, it, for a variety of reasons, it, uh, faculty get to determine what they will teach in their tech in, in their course. So how many times you use a textbook, but you don't use a third of it, or you don't use a certain percent of the textbook um, because either that's not what the course is really about, or maybe uh, you want to focus on other areas. But when you use OER content, especially if you start going down the road of what's called remixing, which is like revising or modifying a book, you can start adding your own content, and, and it really you really begin to craft your course and make it your course um, that you want to teach students. And there's also with um, OER, it's flexible. So there's a thing called the five R's that I'll show you in another slide. Basically means it um, gives faculty the ability to uh, retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute uh, these OER textbooks. And then also it offers an opportunity for academic scholarship and open publication. And as one who teaches at a community college, when we don't focus as much on publishing, or we don't have a publish or parish culture, we more have a service or parish culture. Um, it's all about teaching, high load teaching. You know, I have to teach a minimum of five classes a semester. So I have a high teaching load um, and I have to do a lot of service. But um, coming from an academic background, scholarship and publication is, is important to me. And so this OER has given me the ability to uh, reinvent that myself with that, the academic and my scholarship and my professional development, and then being able to publish this stuff out to my students. And so those are just some of the reasons why uh, institutions may want to consider doing OER. There's many others out there. If you talk to others in either this chat group or go to a conference, you're going to find a whole variety of reasons why people do open educational resources. And they're all valid and they're all legit. So how did open start or OER start at my school? Um, you could argue that faculty have been doing some form of this since the beginning of time. Um, I, know, I have friends who, have, who are faculty here now who were writing their own textbooks um, to their students before there was the, the term OER or um, Creative Commons. They just, this is just what they did. But 
I personally think that my college officially started this process back in the day when the U.S. Department created the uh, TACT grants. And so I was part of a TACT grant. Um, um, it was called uh, Networking Information Systems and Geospatial Technology Consortium, or NISGTC. Um, I don't know if Phil Davis is out there, um, but uh, he, uh, from Del Mar College, uh, he was in this uh, grant with me, and uh, and it was a large grant. This consortium received about $20 million um, that we spread out across multiple schools um, to train students. This was during the Great Recession, and the goal was to train students who lost their jobs in manufacturing and try to get them into high-tech industries. This is also when green jobs became popular, but our goal was to get students into high-tech, and my goal, along with Phil Davis, his school was the geospatial and GIS um, side of the, of the IT. Um, now, everything, from my understanding, it was the, the tax grants, there were, there were four rounds. I was in the first one. Um, but it was, the, from my understanding, it was the first uh, federal grant that actually required all the content you made to be licensed as Creative Commons. I, I could be wrong on that, but I know for a fact that everything we did make had to be licensed as Creative Commons. And then on top of that, there had to be a way for people to access it. And so um, this is where Merlot and Open Professional Education Network, which is also called Open, um, that's where these things kind of grew out of. And now you have other online repositories as well, which I will show you in a minute. But they're basically these large uh, repository search engines where you can go find OER content um, that's already been created. So I'll show you that in a little bit. But that's how I kind of feel we kind of started with o, uh, OER. Here's some of the numbers from my school. So uh, from, from an institutional perspective, you can see our OER sections have grown every year since 2014. Um, we're still actually hashing out our exact numbers um, because again, like I said before, there were faculty doing OER well, uh, we were you know, institutionalizing it. So we're trying to get all that information gathered. But everything you see here it would, is, would be considered the minimum. And this year, uh, our institution uh, ha has now saved a total of $11 million in student textbook costs starting in 2014. Um, you can see OER by subject and the percent. These are actually, um, I, I know for a fact that geosciences, which is mine, is actually a lot higher than listed there. And uh, um, and so you can see on the right, the geoscience department has actually saved students nearly $2 million alone since 2014, starting with those ta that tax grant that I had. And if you break it down, my atmospheric science department started doing OER with their climate change course. And to date, uh, they have saved students 100,000. Geology um, has uh, started doing OER for their Intro to Geology course, and they've saved almost 200,000 in the geography because geography was part of the tax grant, and that includes GIS and drones and all that stuff. You know, we make the majority of it right now at 1.6 million. Um, so yeah, so we're close to 2 million in textbook costs just at my institution, um, which at my calculation of nearly 2 million to 11 million at that college is about 18% of the textbook cost savings at the institution uh, has come from my my department and so i have to give a shout out to mara hannenberger and chris johnson my other full-time faculty who do the atmospheric science and geology they deserve as much credit as i do for any of this stuff so um here if you look at how textbook costs affects slcc students based off a survey um 33 of slcc students have said they did not purchase a textbook um, because of the cost of the textbook 84% of our students have said they delayed it. They delayed the purchase of buying a textbook, probably waiting for financial aid or a grant, or maybe just waiting for that paycheck to come in. 51% um, of our students have registered for fewer courses due to textbooks. Um, that's highly problematic, right? Because that's gonna, uh, you know, if the average is six years to get a two-year degree and you push it to seven, I mean, these students are, you know, their odds of a, of a, succeeding and, and completing and transferring to go get a four-year degree gets wor uh, worse and worse. Um, and 32% of our students who have not registered for a course due to a textbook. So they look at a course 
they said, I'm not going to register for it because first they probably look at the tuition and the fees. And then of course you go to the bookstore and you see the cost of the book and it's just, they can't do it. So these are all strong arguments of why um, you would, an institution would want to consider um, going OER. And if I were to add probably as I'm thinking about it right now, um, why institutions should do, I said social justice and I said academic freedom. From an institutional perspective, when you're looking at uh, uh, enrollments, especially with a good economy like right now, um, if you're looking at retention rates, um, graduation rates, um, those kind of things from an institutional level uh, are also highly important and get played out in terms of like how textbooks impact those, those variables. Um, so how do we sustain OER in my college? Uh, there's many colleges and universities out there who have a very strong and robust OER uh, department or initiative or system. Um, the way it works at our school is all courses using OER textbooks have a $5 OER fee. So what that means is, first off, when students go register for a class, they can actually filter not just by, for example, their general education designation, but they can also uh, filter it um, by if the course uses an OER textbook or not. And so then these students can actually register for, and, and actually get a complete schedule of, t of courses that, are, that have no textbook fees. And we're actually trying to work on having entire programs, like geography is nearly there with having an entire program, not just courses, but entire program with no textbook fees, but the students would pay a $5 OER fee. Where does that OER fee go? A small percent of it stays in the institution within like our faculty development office. Um, but the majority of that $5 fee goes back to the departments that created the OER or who are using the OER. And then it becomes more grassroots because then um, those departments get to decide how to use that money. Uh, some use it to pay adjuncts to help edit and update the OER. Others use it for going to conferences. Others use it for you, you, you name it. Um, and so there's a variety of ways that each department can choose to use that fee. Um, OER is very faculty driven. It's been very grassroots. It always started that way. We're not forcing faculty to, to do it. Um, but since we've been doing this initiative, um, more and more faculty are choosing to go this route. Um, more and more because, not because they didn't want to do it before, but now we're starting to find there's ways to access content without actually having to create it. Um, so I'll come back to that now. We have an advisory committee. Uh, that's made up of a variety of people from faculty and staff and the library and administration, uh, IT, all the key people who are required to, you know, any, all the key people to make OER successful are on this advisory committee. Um, and, so, and that's been very successful to get uh, word of mouth out, buy-in and other things. Um, we joined the Open Textbook Network in 2019. Um, I would kind of show you that in a second. And then this is some of the stuff our library does. I've learned very much that the success of OER is dependent on the staff and administration of OER if they have their own department. Um, it's dependent on faculty because most faculty are the ones who determine what the textbooks will be in the course. And highly important are library, are the librarians. So shout out to all the librarians. And uh, um, in our library, we have an OER and universal access technician to support faculty in locating OER as well as assisting them in OER accessibility concerns. They're trained on Creative Commons licensing um, as well as the Open Textbook Network's a librarianship program. They have an intro to OER course that they can teach faculty and staff through our Professional Development Center. Uh, they created and continue to maintain an OER repository of our own um, that can be accessed publicly and we're exploring the possibility of an in-house OER publication or publishing program which means is um, one of the conversations we're having at our school is is, uh, is standard standardization versus academic freedom right how how do we go about that and then if we're going to offer faculty resources such as editing a textbook um, is there a you know a way to are we going to standardize that a little bit or not? Are we going to use press books? Or are we going to use something else? Or are we going to allow faculty just to choose whatever 
digital, digital medium they want to use to make an OER textbook. Um, right now, for the most part, we we're doing our best to keep it grassroots. So we keep the faculty buy-in. Um, this is my quick award. So I got an award in 2019. Well, I got an award in yeah, 2019. And in November, I was uh, honored to fly to Italy to the Open Education Consortium, but now renamed Open Education Global um, Conference. And uh, they had a, an award called Open Culture. And uh, I was nominated. And they actually renamed the, the award to Open Geography because you know, geography is more than just culture, right? It's, it's physical. It's, it's uh, environmental. It's uh, information systems. It's more than just culture. And so it was an honor to get the award. And it was an honor. Um, have it renamed to Open Geography. Um, okay, so that's that's my institution. So what I want to kind of just look at here real fast is just OER in itself. Um, what's great about OER is that again, here's those five uh, R's of Open. That um, David Wiley, I believe, was the one that came up with these. To be wrong, I believe it was. And uh, OER allows you to make and, and make and own copies. It allows you to use in a wide range of ways. So reuse, revise means to adapt, modify, and improve. Uh, you can combine things. And so to kind of hash that a little better, my OER work is a lot of original work. But I have also looked at other OER content that is licensed in a way that allows me to revise it and remix it. So some of my content is many pieces of other OER content. Now, the catch to that is, is you have to uh, give them credit for it, like as anyone would expect, right? So you don't get to steal someone else's work. You have to give them credit um, for that work. And so that's a, that's a key um, philosophical core to OER is um, we, we love to share, but, but respect is respect. So. Uh, another concern that sometimes I hear with OER is some people, um, usually faculty, will say, um, what, what about the quality? Is the quality of OER the same as the Pearson textbooks or the other ones? You know? From what I have found over and over repeatedly is, yes, it's, it's the same. And we also find, through many studies I've read, not that our school has done any, but just if you read some of the journals, that the, re, the success rates and retention rates um, of students in OER courses versus more traditional uh, textbook courses, um, it, it's roughly the same. And there's an article that came out just on January 14th from the New York Times that, that was quite fascinating to me. And it says it looked at how American history textbooks can differ across the country um, based off the politics of that state. So you might have a book, a history book, and that history book may be modified by the publisher company um, to sell it in a certain way to California because of a more liberal slant, but then change it or modify it another way to sell it in Texas. And that's the two case studies is California versus Texas. And there's been other examples I've seen with this regarding things like climate change. So um, you uh, t uh, textbook company would try to sell a book um, by modifying how they would word climate change in one uh, state and modify it, you know, to maybe something different in another state. Or how southern states look at slavery and how they, in the terms they use, say, you know, slave versus worker. Um, and so my, my impression of it is because the faculty, we, we were all content experts. We know what we're talking about. We've been schooled in this stuff. We know what's what's accurate, and with an OER, we can go in there and change it. Um, if it's not an OER, if it's a regular textbook and it's just printed the way it is, and it says that uh, you know, uh, African workers rather than African slaves, you know, you can't change that in the book. And so, I'm a firm believer that um, OER can be as accurate as the more traditional route, and it can be as inaccurate as the traditional route. This, Goes both ways. All right, so um, what I'm just going to briefly show you here is a lot of faculty will say to me, um, I want to do OER, I believe in OER, I believe in what it does, I want to reduce the textbook costs for my students, but I don't have time to write a book like you do, Adam. 
what can I do? And so there's a whole bunch of repositories that you can go and search for and um, find information already created. You can look at it, you can download it. Um, if you look at how they have copywritten it, you may be allowed to remix it or revise it, rewrite it, mash it up with a, maybe you find two OER content and you want to kind of mash them together. Um, so you don't have to create your own work to do OER. And I think that's critically important um, to, to make sure that's out there. And also the other thing that's important to say that's out there is OER does not mean textbooks either. OER could mean assignments. It can mean discussion forums. It could be a syllabus, sharing out syllabi. Uh, the Geotech Center has done that, where we share, we ask uh, faculty to submit to us their syllabi so that other faculty can see the curriculum design of courses across the country. Um, but also there's things called open pedagogy. How do you get your students to actively participate and engage and maybe help uh, rewrite or remix or re, uh, re, reimagine um, the OER content. So how do you get students involved? And that's called open pedagogy. So when you get the PowerPoint from me, all you have to do is click on the images and it'll take you to the, the actual website. Um, so Merlot is one. Uh, this again was created partly because of the tax grants, um, but you can just type in the keywords in there and it's just kind of like Googling it, but it's in Merlot. Um, BC campus is huge. I uh, highly recommend you go to that. So um, you go to it, I click on it. There's open stacks here. And so you can go and you say, okay, um, find a book. This is, this is open at BC campus. You can find a book and you can go through here are these subjects. Um, I'm just going to pick one sociology. There's some sociologists out there. But here's an introduction to sociology that, that um, BC campus is holding as a repository. And it's a whole textbook already to go. Um, you can just take um, and it's licensed as Creative Commons. Um, sorry, Al. Here's the open textbook library. This is also a great repository. You can just click on browse subject and you can find already created textbooks. Many of these have been also um, uh, peer reviewed, which is also a critical part of OER is working on having things peer reviewed. Um, here's OER Commons. I'm gonna click on this one just because I did an experiment with it once. So here's OER Commons, just give me an example. What am I looking for? I'm gonna say geography. What's my subject? Well, there's geography is probably one of these two. I'm going to do this one for now. What's my education level? Community colleges. Standard, I'm not too worried about all these standards. So if I go search, here's all these textbooks um, that you that are OER licensed. And of course, HIT is one of mine. So it takes you to it, gives you a description, and I can go to it, and there it is. And here's my Here's one of my textbooks. Okay. Um, but if I go back to that, to, the, oh, to this, sorry, this one, you can see there's other things in here I thought was interesting. An intro to human geography syllabus with reading. That is also considered Creative Commons. And that might be a great way for you, if you're designing a new course or revamping a course, to see what um, that might look like. And so syllabi, assignments, discussions, these are all, if the license is Creative Commons, they're great. And then you can see over here the subjects and the readings for that course by this faculty member. Uh, here's OpenStax, um, again, a repository, one of the most popular ones. They have lots of science ones in there. I recommend you check it out for time. I'm just going to go through some of these Creative Commons. Uh, uh, another search engine. Here's the Tech Center, and uh, as Rich was mentioning earlier, we have created a series of model courses uh, focusing on geospatial technology, and these are all aligned directly to the Department of Labor's geospatial technology competency model. And so, uh, if you go to the Geotech website, Corner Education Model Courses, you can find all this content here for free. And then that takes me to my stuff here. So. I just click on my website. Okay. 
Um, here's what mine is, it's always uh, opengeography.org. And if I kind of just go through here, you can see I have these books list so far. This is my geology department's book. Um, I'm working on some lab manuals. And in the future, I'm working on some photography. I like to have them here. So maybe that could be also a form of OER, right? If you're uh, looking for images, especially with uh, geology or physical geography, you know, these images I take here, you can use them in your PowerPoints, in your OER textbooks, in your lab manuals, whatever you want to use them for. That's kind of like where I'm moving forward with that. Um, the way I do my textbooks, uh, I used to, this is a Weebly site. Uh, I used to use Weebly because I wanted to have a textbook that was multimodal. I wanted embedded links. I wanted embedded videos. If I'm talking about climate change, I want to have a scientist um, from NASA talking about climate change in the book. That's you know one of those ways of going to like primary sources of stuff. So if I click on these, and let's say I picked on uh, physical geography, okay. So if I go down here, you can see all the chapters of, of this textbook. Um, or if I go to uh, human geography, the one I was showing you earlier. You can see here, I have it broken down a little. I'm kind of breaking things down a little more like this instead of the straight chapters. Students seem to like, be able to like just go to pieces of it instead. But if I go to this, if I click on um, chapter two, here's what it looks like. Okay, and it takes you, here's the sections and the references. And you just kind of click next or you click the hyperlink. And it's got the content in here. It's got embedded videos that will play um, throughout the chapter from either National Geographic or NPR or wherever. And um, it adds uh, an, uh, a way for students to engage visually to the content. Uh, what's great with Pressbooks is it's mobile friendly. Um, so I tell my students, I just we started class this week and I told them that there are three apps I want them to have on their phone at all times. It's, the, it's our Canvas app, it's Google Earth, and I want them to screen, I want them to bookmark or put on their home screen the textbook. So if they're anywhere and they need to study for my class, they can just pull up their phone and read the textbook. The videos show pull up just perfectly in a smartphone or a tablet, and it's just great. Now, Pressbooks is kind of become more of the traditional standard of, of um, OER. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, Maybe it's because it has kind of like a textbook feel to it. But I stayed away from press books for most of my OER career um, until they were, until I think it was last year, maybe two years ago, they allowed you to start embedding videos. Because when I was using Weebly and I was using like this natural disasters book here, which is my last book I got to convert over, I wanted, I wanted videos. I wanted multimodal. I wanted that kind of stuff in it. And this wasn't, a, this, these videos were not an option a few years ago with press books, but now they are. And I found that um, my hits, because I have a Google Analytics, you know, embedded in my books and on Open Geography, uh, they are, uh, I'm getting a lot more hits now to these books because they're now in press books versus when they were just on Weebly, even though the Weebly site was also HTML coded to OER. So, um, so you're welcome to check out my Open Geography textbook. Um, you just go to opengeography.org and they're all listed here. You start looking at lab manuals. Like I said, there's other things here I'm coming up with because it's, it's kind of a one person shop. Um, but I, though I have help with the college at times. And so feel free to check any things out. Feel free to use them um, and modify them, remix them, do whatever you want to do to it. So um, with that, that's a little longer than I was actually thinking I was going to go. So if there are there's a better way to do this. So I'm going to end it at that. Here's how you can contact me, my email, uh, my ePort, my professional ePortfolio, uh, my website, opengeography.org, and my Twitter handle. Um, and so I'm going to leave it at that, and I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Adam. Uh, man, lots of great information. And so, folks, if you have specific questions, go ahead and type those in. Um, and we will get started with a few thoughts. Uh, Rich, I think you've got some at the top of your list there. I do have some questions, Adam, that have come in from our viewers. 
you mentioned academic freedom that pertains to your OEMs. How is that perceived by the administrators or your IRB? Um, do they look at those? Do they not look at those? And is there complete academic freedom? What is the the uh, kind of the takeaway on that? Yes, uh, we have um, quite a bit of support from our administration regarding OER. Um, they appreciate the, um, the faculty scholarship that comes with it. Um, I think from well, and from a, a tenure, we have tenure at our college, and so from a tenure rank advancement uh, side, uh, you can use it in your portfolio for rank and tenure. And so a lot of faculty, I know one of my friends, Melissa Hardy, is doing a biology lab manual. Um, and they're using telescopes, cameras in their labs to take photos, and she's using a lot of open pedagogy. She's making sure that is in her uh, e-portfolio so she can apply for tenure in two years. Um, I used it, it was in my e-portfolio when I applied for a full professor last year. I'm already tenured. Um, and our administration uh, appreciates it because we're having lots of conversations right now as our school is becoming, as our student population is becoming more diverse, um, we're we are trying to figure out ways to help reduce costs for students, how to help with the retention and, and completion rates. And so from a cabinet perspective, I think they appreciate faculty trying to do their part to help with student retention and student success. So they, so, uh, and it's all academic freedom because no one can tell, tell a faculty member you have to do OER either. Um, it's up to the faculty to decide if they want to do that. And because we're slowly changing the culture, we're getting more and more faculty buy-in. So we have support from our associate deans, our deans, our faculty leadership, and our executive cabinet and provost. Great, Adam. Another question that came in is, does your institution reward or compensate faculty for using OER? Is, or, or are there any other incentives for going the OER route? There, um, you can apply for um, some stipends. Um, the um, through our faculty development um, office, there's a variety of little like uh, maybe stipends or grants you could apply for. Um, a five dollar fee goes to the department, as I mentioned before, that OER fee, and that can be used towards having our faculty go to a, a conference for that kind of professional development. Um, and again, what's great about that is that the department gets to decide how to use that money. And so uh, professionally, because uh, I started this so long ago, I'm doing more maintaining. I don't get a, I don't get um, a financial incentive for doing this, and I don't get a work release or you know teaching release time to do it. It is a labor of love. Um, I love doing it for the freedom, academic freedom, the scholarship. I love doing it for my students. Um, my students seem to enjoy the book more. And because I wrote the book, I make sure they read it. And so I'm finding my students are more successful in my class, so that's a motivating factor. So I'm not sure that answers the question fully, but uh, we do have support. We do have some in initiative uh, money for it. Um, and as we keep scaling up OER, we're, we're looking for other potential grant opportunities. Some faculty have been paid through grants, um, like working with uh, Lumen Learning and a couple others. So. Um, it just kind of varies. Great, thank you, Adam. A uh, question came in, in addition to OERs, have you made use of library materials as well, particularly thinking of streaming video, which has a lot of content in library video sources, especially for some of the lower level geography or earth science courses. So can you talk to us a little bit about whether you've used any streaming video? Uh, not not through our library. Um, the videos that I have embedded in my press books are all coming from YouTube. And and from a geography and an earth science perspective, there's this, uh, there's an amazing amount of, of videos from either NASA, NOAA, National Geographic, um, all sorts of like science channels. Uh, so you don't copyright problem with that if you're you know getting something from NASA or National Geographic or even from if it was like a you know a private company because you're not downloading the YouTube I'm just connecting a link it's just a link that shows up as a visual in my press books 
but I actually didn't download the, the video. It's actually an embedded link. Um, and if you clicked on the YouTube link, it would take you to the original source. And so that's how I do that. It also keeps the, um, the file size of the book um, way down versus downloading all these videos and having them embedded in, you know, uploaded into the book. I hope that answers it. Like I highly recommend if you can find a URL link, go that route because you don't have to worry about copyright. You do have to worry about um, uh, if the link breaks, but you're not downloading it. So it's okay for licensing um, and copyright and it keeps the file size down. Exactly. And as you mentioned before, Adam, too, um, we want to be cognizant of how much that that reader is going to have to download and, and maybe what sort of machine they're using and so forth. So that's definitely a consideration there. A uh, question came in about um, if you are a student and your instructor or your professor is using an OEM, how, how can you be sure that that's up to date? Is, um, is that pretty much up to the professor to ensure that or how does that work? Absolutely, that's totally up to the professor. Um, it's the faculty member's job to make sure that's up to date. Um, now I do know that you know a lot of faculty who use traditional textbooks also allow students to use older versions, right? So you might have, if a textbook gets renewed every three years, uh, I know faculty who let students use like maybe two versions older. So then you're looking at a book that's like nine years old. Um, and so, that might be problematic in some courses in an earth science class, maybe not as much, but what's so powerful about OER, um, the way I do it and the way my professor in geology does it, you take that, you know, you take that earthquake in Puerto Rico last week, and I can instantly add that to the book, right? If the big one hits LA, I can put that in the book. If there's a natural disaster, or if, if we go to war next week with Iran, I can instantly put that in the book in the human or world geography book. So I get to keep that up to date at all times and it definitely keeps it more relevant um, for my students. And they, and they appreciate the constant current events that get popped into these OER books. So I think that's one of the strongest, um, and that's getting with flexibility, but that's one of, the, one of the strongest things for me for, as a faculty member is I get to keep that book completely up to date depending on what's going on around the world at any given time. I think that's a great point about updating it sort of on the fly, which with a traditional type of textbook, you'd never have the opportunity to do that. What's in print is in print and that's it. So uh, dovetailing with that question that we just had, Adam, um, give us a basic idea about how long this process might take from when you're starting with something like this and when you feel that it is in a, in a position to actually use it and kind of compare that with what you might have with a traditional publisher where you're going to have to go through various versions and so forth. Um, just talk a little bit about the, the time element of how long it takes you to produce one of these OERs. <laughs> uh, my heart and soul. Um, that's the cost of it, my heart and soul. Uh, you know, that's a hard question. Uh, when I started doing the OER officially with the TAC grant in 2014, but I had pulled together a lot of information from teaching at the college since 2006. So from 2006 to 2013 is what ended up in my 2014, you know? And so it's a big endeavor if you're gonna go from scratch. And that's, I think, the biggest fear I have that might turn some faculty member off. Um, if you're new to it and you're looking to try some stuff, start, Start, uh, there's nothing wrong with starting one, is go find a textbook. Go find an OER textbook that's pretty close to what you want to teach. Maybe it's not perfect, but it's very unlikely that the book you're using right now is perfect either. But go find a, a you know, a, like go to OpenStax or go to Merlot or whatever and see if you can find a book that fits your, pretty close to your curriculum. And then you got your book and then you always, all of a sudden just save your students all this money. Um, and then after that, if you want to start doing your own, start maybe with discussion forums. Uh, start with, like, you know, searching and look, looking on the web for syllabi, 
discussion forums, assignments. You know, I've got this open GRP lab stuff that I've been working on and I've been pulling from other areas from ESRI and GIS, et cetera, and stuff. And they've all <laughs> this Creative Commons. Um, start that way. And then if you start creating stuff, like an assignment that you want licensed as OER, you can then go and register with Merlot or OER Commons or wherever, and you can upload your material to the Commons. Then other people can have access have access to it. Um, I talked to Joe Sikursky a little bit about that. He's got some a lot of his GIS stuff in these repositories, um, and it's kind of hard to know if people find it. And so uh, there's a bit of a it can be a little frustrating putting things in a repository because you're just one of a million in there. And so trying to get people to see your stuff. Um, all the things that I'm finding in my in these repositories of mine, I didn't put in there. I'm just kind of, at the end of the day, I'm really just focusing on my students and then I'm putting out into the world for anyone who wants to use it. But my goal is, my number one goal are my students. And so start small, start again, start small. And once you start creating some stuff, share it to the either share it with your own faculty in your institution maybe share it within your uh, network at your, in your state present at a conference and say hey here's the repository here's the link to all this stuff i made you're free to use it and it's just sometimes word of mouth kicks in and then once you start getting the hits if i do a google search for my name i'm going to find uh, either my professional portfolio or my oer open geography website the first two hits and it's just because of over time of word of mouth but Start small. Don't think you have to take it all on at once because you'll burn out. Don't reinvent the wheel. That's really what I'm getting at. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, we had a, a listener here that's asking the question about um, what your formats are for this. You mentioned that you use Pressbooks for some of the more recent ones, and previously you used Weebly. Uh, are these open? educational resources, are they available in other formats? So, for example, would I be able to get a PDF or would I be able to uh, get a hard copy of it? Things like that. Yes. Okay. So, um, great question. That was another reason why uh, going to press books is a good response to that. Now, if you want to have your press book on the web, like mine is right now, it's $25 per book. If you want to make downloadable in, the, in like as a Nook, uh, as a Kindle, as a PDF or something to that extent, you're going to have to pay $100 per book. But of course, then just have your school pay for that. Don't pay it for that yourself. But um, that's my next step actually is to create my Pressbooks account so that my students can print off or if not print off, at least download the the book in, in a variety of different formats. The press book is great for that because if you, when you change it in on the website, it automatically will, sh it will update the the other ways you can download it. So it's only one update and it, and it just dominoes, you know, downwards. Right. Yeah, and you gave us a good idea about at your institution how many of your faculty are using these open educational resources and uh, it's, a, it's a large number of your faculty that are using these but um, what about around the country do you have any feel for other institutions um, you know how many of them are you really going to a model similar to yours that you have at Salt Lake you know that's hard to know um, uh, I go back to this you know, if I look at OpenStax here, they've been trying to track who's using their OpenStax materials. So um, you're looking here. Uh, this is an interactive map, but this is just a screenshot of it. But, but, but the only way they know is if you let them know that you're using one of their books. And that's something I can get better at as well as finding a way to say, hey, just let me know if you're using my book or if you're remixing it. I don't care if you're changing it up. Just let me know if you're using it so I can kind of keep track. Um, it's, it's a lot than you would think to know who's using what. Um, I know from my Google Analytics that um, I'm get. You know, I know there's ten other countries around the world that are probably using my book um, to some extent or another, just because of how many hits I'm constantly getting from these countries. Um, but that doesn't tell me which school that is, um, 
And so unless I get an email or something from that faculty member, um, it's hard for me to know exactly everybody using it. Um, so, but I think, you know, I kind of like what Sachs is doing here with maybe some kind of map, almost like the geotech uh, map we have um, for programs in GIS, but doing it it's hard to know. I will say, very impressed when I went to the global conference, how global OER is. It's not an American thing. It's, it's in the conversations around OER in the United States are incredibly different than the conversations in Europe where more of the education system is paid for than ours. And it's very different when you're talking about places in um, the continent of Africa or uh, Indonesia. And so, but it's, it's definitely a growing movement. I do not feel like this is a fad. I think this is really um, uh, a new wave of how higher ed is going to be moving towards. And the, and the publisher companies, the, you know, the private ones, are trying to adapt towards it as well. Well, thanks, Adam. Uh, and Rich, thank you for uh, joining us as well. Folks, we are out of time today, but um, remember to keep an eye on your inbox. We will be in touch with a link to the recording um, as, as well as several links to the many um, resources and things available. So keep an eye on that. Uh, special thanks again to Adam and the Geotech Center for hanging out with us today. We hope that you'll give us some feedback on the survey and also um, check out the other webinars that are in the Geotech Center collection. Um, we've archived several years of these wonderful speakers, so do check that out at your convenience. We hope that you go make it a great day. Tell a friend about the Geotech Center and Directions Magazine, and we will see you again soon. Thanks, everybody.